Here. Hey, on all of our campuses, we send greetings to you. We're so glad you're a part of us. If you're online, uh, odds are you're in a warmer place than we are. So anyway, uh, thanks for being a part of us. Again, whether you're local or uh, anywhere in the country or the, the world, wherever you are, hey, uh, we appreciate you being with us as well. So today, uh, we kind of kick off Easter. All right, now, I'm going to talk about um, what's called Palm Sunday today. And uh, I'll get to that in just a moment. But this week is uh, just hugely significant. If you are a, a Jesus follower and Christ means something to you, this week is the best week. I mean, it is like where everything comes back into focus. We remember and we appreciate again uh, what God did for us. And so we're going to do that this week. Um, there's a couple of things about this week I want to make you aware of. We normally don't do this, but this year we thought we we're going to try to do something different. And that is that we're, we normally start like when there's Christmas and Easter, we start like in the middle of the week and go all through the week. We, we wanted to do something different this week. We wanted to do a, uh, a Good Friday service. So on all of our campuses on Friday night at six o'clock, we're going to hold a service that's different than the Easter service. That's what you need to make a note, which means every one of us should be a, uh, should want to come because it's going to be a very special day. Now, you got to understand Good Friday is called Good Friday for what it did for us. But it was a horrific day for Jesus. And what we're going to do is we're going to get together. and We're going to sit in that for a little while. And uh, it's not an upbeat like, oh, yeah, yeah, awesome. Uh, that'll come the next day. Uh, that's with the resurrection. But the sadness is uh, what Good Friday is all about. And I invite you to come and just meditate and reflect with, that, with, with us on that. So every, every campus, Saturday, uh, Friday night, six o'clock. And then on every campus, starting on Saturday, uh, and again, you gotta check your local campus because I don't know the times on all the different sites. Uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, quite a few uh, Easter services. And uh, it, it's gonna actually be part two to the message I'm gonna start today. And uh, it'll make sense when you hear it. But anyway, we'll invite you to come. Now, here's what I want to encourage you to do. And I, and I, I do believe this. I, I believe that people who know you, that you go to church, <clears throat> they, they, they hope that you care enough about them that you would think to invite them to come with you. All right. Now, that mean they're going to come and maybe a lot of them would. But they're not going to come most likely if you don't show any interest and they're going to make an assumption about you that you really don't care if you don't bother to invite them. And so here's a church. Here's my challenge. OK, invite everyone, you know, it, it, it's only going to send a good vibe that you care about them. And who knows? Who knows? Uh, I believe that uh, Easter changes uh, everything in life when you understand what happened and any opportunity that we can get to experience that is going to be a really, really good one. So, all right, all right, all right. Okay, here's what I need you to do. Uh, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 21. Now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk quick today because I want to cover some ground. And, and what I want to talk about, I think is really, really, really important. Okay, and really, really glad you're here because I think you're going to be glad you uh, came because we're going to connect some dots for you. Uh, but find Matthew chapter 21. So I want to ask you a question. If I tell you, think, uh, think about Jesus, what image comes to your mind when you think about Jesus? Like just what pops in your head? Um, how old is he? So m most of us uh, would say, most of us would say somewhere right around 30 to 33 years old, somewhere in that. Now, scholars tell us that most likely Jesus was crucified when he was 33 years old. Now, part of the problem is, is that, again, depending on how you see Jesus, you know, my sweet little baby Jesus, I don't know how you picture Jesus. Um, but, but the truth is, is that we're in America, we usually picture, a, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed, uh, European descended Jesus. It's probably not at all what Jesus actually looked like. But, but when it comes to his age, I, I, I want to point something out that I think is really, really important. So if Jesus lived to be 33 years old, and that's not really debated, um, then uh, I just did the math. Here's, here's the simple math. It's really simple, okay? There's 52 weeks in a year, 33 years times 52, 1716. What is 1716? 1716 is the number of weeks that Jesus lived. Uh, 1,716. Of all the weeks that Jesus lived, the most significant week that he lived was the week that we're entering into right now. This is why this is so important. Um, this particular week is unlike any other week in his life and it's unlike any week in your life. And this is the week that changes everything. If you understand what's actually happening during this week. This week is so important that the biographers of Jesus, Matthew and Luke, spend one fourth of their entire words on this last week. Mark, 
The biographer of Jesus spends one third of his words on this last week. And John, the fourth biographer, spends one half of his words. One half of the book of John is about what starts today and goes through this week. It's simply that important. And, and so we're going to talk about that. Now, this week has been called a number of things. I don't know what you call it. I don't know what you call it. Uh, it's often called Passion. It's Easter week. It's Passion week, which, by the way, we so misuse the word passion. We go, we go passion. He's so passionate. He gets so excited. He's passionate. Passion means suffering. Passion means that you, you're so into something. That's what the true root of it is. You're so into it that you would be willing to suffer for its advancement. That's passion. So it's called Passion Week. It's called the Great Week in some traditions, called the Holy Week in others, uh, but it's that week. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend uh, our time just to talk about the first day of this week and this, this today. Uh, this is known as Palm Sunday. And when you walk out of here, you'll understand what that is. Uh, if, if you, uh, I'm going to say, it's just going to sound like I'm exaggerating. If you don't connect the dots on what we're talking about today, listen carefully. I promise you the life of Jesus won't make sense and understanding of the Bible will not come to you. I, I want to plead with you to pay attention with today. Okay. And I, I, you, you do, I, you do. But today I, I'm going to give you like a very quick, very precise, concise uh, history lesson uh, so that you can understand what happened on this day. If you can connect these dots, I promise you, you're going to see it like you've never seen it. And so I plead with you, just indulge me. Uh, I, I will not, I won't dwell. I'll get you out of here and we'll, 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 we'll have a good day. Okay, just stay with me. So let's go to Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to read fast. I'm going to talk fast. I'm going to think fast and you're going to follow fast. Thank you. Very good. Some of you were a little slow on that. Pick it up, pick it up. Okay, here we go. Matthew 21. Uh, you've heard this, you've seen it already. Let me say it as Matthew told us. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there uh, with her colt by her and untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd uh, spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, John tells us it wasn't just any branches, it was palm branches. And there's where we get the name Palm Sunday. Palm, it was palm branches, all right? Now the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. They're shouting at Jesus as he's coming into Jerusalem. Uh, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Folks, so this, this is quite the scene. The, this, the place is a lot. It's electric. It's happening. It's buzzing. Everyone's going like, you see what's going on? This, when, when all of this comes to pass, what's going to happen is this is going to be for those people, that kind of an event in their life, like 9-11 was in our life. If I said, where were you on when you heard about 9-11? You'll go, oh, I know exactly where I was. I don't, you can see it. This is that kind of an event. And you're going to understand for these people, this is a moment. They're going to, where were you? It, it, this, this day, this moment we're going to talk about is going to come up at barbecues in the days to come for these people. They're going to, you know what? I was there. I was, I was actually right outside the gate. You're kidding. You were there. I, I tell you, I saw him go by. I, I'm telling you, it was incredible. This is how important this day is. So how, what's, what's, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? All right, now, here's what you need to understand. This is the first time in a long time that Jesus is going into Jerusalem. I don't know what image you have. Uh, most of us think of Jesus popping in and out of Jerusalem. If you read the Bible, oh yeah, he was in, he's out, he's in, he's out, he's in the gates, he's, you know, hanging out. Um, it's not really kind of how it goes. Uh, Jesus showed up a couple times in, in Jerusalem. You might remember 
when he was a really little baby, he was blessed by Simeon. You might remember when he was 12, that he uh, was uh, in the temple and his parents left him. Remember that was when he was 12, that was in Jerusalem. Uh, he shows up at a feast and a festival every now and then. Uh, we don't know how many because it depends how you read the different gospels. Uh, he's not frequently in Jerusalem. Now what, what you find if you pay attention is that it'll say, so the chief priests from Jerusalem went to meet him and they found him up in a place. In other words, Jesus was getting known and things were being said about him, but he wasn't coming into Jerusalem to do these things. Jerusalem was going out to him because they would find out, they would, word would circulate where he was. And so he'd get a following. Now, just to make this make sense, I wanna show you a map. And this, this map is the map of the Israel in the time of Jesus, just to give you a basic idea. And uh, there's three places I want to point out. Now, he was other places, but I want to point out three places. First is Nazareth. Now, I know you can't see Nazareth on that map. So see the block, see the city. That's in Nazareth. That's where Jesus grew up. That's where Jesus was a carpenter. That's where his parents, that's okay, a lot. The early years of Jesus were spent there. Um, and then uh, about age 30, he started his ministry. And that lasted for three years. And uh, in those Three years, he was centered out of a different city on the tip, on the upper uh, north side of the Sea of Galilee uh, named Capernaum. And you can see Capernaum, that's the circle. That's, that's where the majority of Jesus's ministry was up in that area, all right, Northern Galilee. Jerusalem is all the way down south and there's gonna be a triangle, that's Jerusalem. So <clears throat> Jesus, uh, and by the way, Jerusalem is south on a map, but it's up in elevation. So you go up to Jerusalem, even though you're going south to get there. So you've got these places and most of Jesus' life is spent up north. That's what you need to understand. And it's important. Now, word's getting around. He's doing stuff. He's doing stuff. Now, you got to understand, they had no social media. There's nobody posting anything. But people are talking, man. I saw him. You know what I saw him do? There, there, there was this blind guy. And I'm telling you, he walked away seeing. I'm telling you, there was this guy that couldn't walk. He was lame. He, he healed. I'm telling you, this guy was in the grave and I saw him come out of the grave. Well, folks, you got to understand that that is hot press item right there. I mean, that everyone's going to be talking about that. This is what's happening. So everyone's hearing about Jesus and and, and like, uh, but, but did you see him? No. Oh, how would I see him? I just never been fortunate to be in the same place as where he was. Now, I'm going to shift directions for just a second. I want to explain something to you that you've got to understand to understand what's happening. So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Here's the other thing you've got to connect with this. There is one thing that's on the heart of all the Jewish people at this time in history. One thing that matters to them more than anything. And that is we are sick and tired of being dominated by Rome. We want freedom from Rome. Rome was seen as the occupying force, the oppressive force. We want out of control by Rome. And what's going to start happening and what's going to see on this day is people are starting to go, he's the guy who's going to free us from Rome. He's the guy who's going to, he's going to bring us a future. He's going to give us a whole different story. He's the guy. Now I want to show you that. And that's going to make sense. Now, again, I've already said, <clears throat> this is Jesus first time back in a long time coming into Jerusalem. Let me say a couple of things that you need to understand about Jerusalem in the day. Jerusalem was the epicenter of Israel. Jerusalem was uh, it was the capital. It was where David, a long time earlier, had set up his kingdom. Uh, it was where the temple was. And Jerusalem is where it's at. It's where it's going on. So even to this day, Jerusalem is like the religious epicenter of Israel. But in that day, everyone would just understand Jerusalem. All right, Jerusalem. Now, I want to I want to show you something. And again, this is just go with me on this. OK, I want to take you back a thousand years before the day that we're talking about this Palm Sunday. I want to take you back to the time of David. Now, you might remember David, David and Goliath and the sling. And then he became king. And he was you guys, you got to understand, David was like the greatest king Israel had ever seen. David was a warrior. David was a fighter. Uh, David was a guy that man, he was a man's man and everybody just. David, all right, now I wanna show you something from scripture that you gotta to see to understand what's happening on the day that we're talking about where Jesus comes into Jerusalem. You gotta connect these two dots. A thousand years before, there's a promise made by Nathan the prophet to King David. And um, it, it, was, uh, 
it was, it's, it was known, it's become known, let me put it that way, is what's called the Davidic covenant, the covenant between God and David. So let me show you what a thousand years before had been promised to David. All right, here we go. This is 2 Samuel 7, 8. Now then, this is Nathan being told, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, David, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did in the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed uh, leaders over my people Israel. I, I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. All right. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. Okay. So David, you need to understand that the kingdom that you've established is going to go forward. And then you go down a couple of verses to 2 Samuel 7, 13, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This was a huge thing to say to a king. Hey, I just want you to know, Mr. Monarch, that from here on, Okay, and, and so, so David's going, this, this is un unbelievable. And he's humble about it and all of that. So let me just, again, quick, all right? So David has a son, he has a number of sons. Solomon succeeds him as king. Solomon is that wise, that wise leader. And he was so wise that people would travel all over the world just to pick his brain because he was just known as having this incredible wisdom. That's Solomon. Solomon dies and the kingdom goes into the, 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 his uh, son's name. That's a guy named Rehoboam. Now, here's what you need to understand. When Rehoboam becomes king, he's a huge ego and Rehoboam blows the entire nation into two parts. He, he creates literally a, a civil unrest and, and there's like a civil war and Israel that you saw there broke into two. There were 10 tribes of Israel, 10 tribes, meaning 10 of the 12 families that descended from Jacob were, went with the north and they were in that part of the country that was called Israel. And, and then two, two tribes went to the south and that was called Judah. So Israel and Judah are two kingdoms now that once were one kingdom under David and Solomon. And then they blew into two. And you got to understand they often fought each other. Sometimes they would ally with each other against a common outside enemy. But the truth is, is that as history goes on, bad things happen to both kingdoms. Again, I'm doing really quick. Here's what you need to realize. About 700 years uh, before Jesus, the Assyrians come and conquer uh, the Northern Kingdom. The Assyrians come and, and, and there's called the Assyrian captivity. They, they destroyed things and they hauled people away as prisoners of war. About 500 years before Jesus, uh, the Southern Kingdom fell uh, because of the Babylonian empire. And so that started what was called the Babylonian captivity. Prisoners of war hauled off. And uh, in Babylon, so the Northern tribe, if, if there's all kinds of questions. Do they ever like ever come back? The Southern kingdom came back when Cyrus released them. And again, about debated 50 to 70 years later, that they could come home. He released the prisoners of war and they came home. And here's what you got to understand now, you're, you're 500 years, 400 years before Jesus, they come home and everything is different. Everything's lost, everything's gone. Everything that we cherish, the temple's destroyed, the city's destroyed, every, our homes are destroyed. And they're, absolutely, they're grieving and mourning. And uh, this is when they decide, well, you know, we should build a, we should rebuild the temple. It was called the second temple. And they were starting to lay the foundation stones. They sat and wept. They said, this is so much less than it used to be. Nehemiah and Ezra, if you remember those books in the Bible, they came in and Nehemiah goes, the walls are torn down around the city. There's no protection to the city. And so he orchestrated the building project to get the walls and the gates put back up. And Ezra was the one who, you know, was the 
about the word of God. We got to get back to the word of God. And so it was an attempt to reestablish everything. And by the way, just thinking of books of the Bible, if you ever see in your Bible, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, and you wonder what that's all about, that's about the kings of the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom and all the things that they did. See, the Bible is, tells us this story. So they come back and they're trying their hardest to reestablish the nation the way it once was. And then something else happens in history. It's called Rome. The Roman Empire secedes the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, remember the push you know, into India, remember all that? Now the Romans come. The Romans overcome the, the Greeks and the Roman force comes in and the, Romes, the Rome comes and they literally, they conquer everything. And, and they just absolutely take over. They come in, they put their own people uh, over the people of Israel. They put their own courts in place. They put their own king, their own, you know, uh, Caesar. Everything's everything. Now, this is the new order of the day. And here's what I'm trying to get across to you. The people in Israel hated it. We hate this. And we want desperately to be free from this. And uh, it's, the, it's the cry of the heart of the people of Israel in, in this day. Now, let me say this. Why, why, why did they let it happen? Folks, it's very simple to explain. They were outmanned and outgunned. That's all I can tell you. They didn't have the force. They didn't have the ability. So Rome takes over and they're under the thumb of Rome. And, and here's the cry of the heart. God, please, can you restore us to the days of greatness? Can you put it like it was? Can you make us like we used to be? Give us back a king like David. Give us back a king like Solomon. Put us together. Father, it's miserable what, we're, what we've become. Now, here's what got out. Word started circulating because <coughs> it was prophecy that the Messiah was going to come and the Messiah was going to be the savior. The Messiah was going to come, set the record straight, fix all the problems. And they began to look for this coming Messiah. Now, I want to I want to read to you something. I, I read this before and we were in the study on All In and we were talking about legacy. We were talking about Abraham. But I want to show you something that, that I want you to connect some dots. So if you ever try to read your Bible and you start in the New Testament, you start with the book of Matthew because it's the first book in the New Testament. If you start in the book of Matthew, the first thing you do is you get into genealogies. Can I get an amen? amen. And you start reading this and so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and you go, I'm done. I'm out. There's nothing interesting about that, right? You got to get past that. But I want to show you the concluding verse of those genealogies because they're in there for a reason. The problem is when you don't know, you don't know. I don't know why they're in there. It just seems like a bunch of names that don't mean anything. Let me show you something. The last of the genealogy ends with this, Matthew 1, 17. There were 14 generations between Abraham and David. There were 14 generations between David and the Babylonian captivity. There were 14 generations between the Babylonian captivity and the Messiah. Now you understand why the genealogy is in there. You go from David, Babylonian captivity, Jesus. All right. So Jesus is coming to town and word is out. He's coming down the hill. He is coming to town. It's him. And people are going crazy. I got to get a seat. I got to watch this. And so he comes in. Yeah, the, the uh, people shouting all of this stuff the, the I, I was able to look this up online. The uh, headlines in the Jerusalem Gazette on that day uh, Jesus triumphantly enters Jerusalem. It's everybody's number one news item. Because guess what it means? Finally, a king like David, a king like David who's going to conquer and be a warrior. And we're going to fight finally and we're going to overcome Rome. Can I, um, can I show you something that maybe you, you never saw before in the Bible? You might have caught it, but you might not have caught the significance of it. Let me show you this. Um, remember when Jesus fed the 5,000, you know, just a few fish, a few loaves, remember that whole story? And he fed, you know, 5,000 people and all the leftovers. Can, can I read you what happens right after that? It says this in John 6. After the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. This is him. 
This is him. Now watch this. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Here's what you need to understand. They recognize this is him. This is the Messiah. We're going to put him on the throne and, and our day has come and Jesus wants nothing to do with it. So he slips away. Now he's coming into Jerusalem and they're going, he's not getting away this time. We, 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 we're going to make him king. Now there's something really weird going on right here though. Because we're expecting a, a warrior like David, man. You know, the sword coming out of his mouth kind of a thing, riding on a Persian steed. He's coming in. He's our conqueror. He's going to, Braveheart. Picture it. William Wallace. And here comes Jesus riding on a donkey. Now, I don't know how that strikes you, but a donkey is not a war horse. A donkey is a humble, gentle animal that's not exactly majestic. And he comes riding in and they're going, everything about this is awesome. Well, we're here except get off the donkey. You're killing the image, man. We're taking pictures and these are not going to post well. You know, we're going to crop the donkey out, but really. Now see, scripture said he would ride in on a donkey and he rides in on a donkey and they're like, okay, eh, not so much. Don't like that image. Um, here's where you got to start to understand the, uh, the expectation and the reality are going to begin to separate. Okay. Stay, just hold that idea. They cut branches and uh, they cut, uh, John tells us, I told you that they're palm branches, not just branches, palm branches. Here's what I need to explain to you that you don't probably know. It will make, make it make a ton of sense. This a palm branch is, which is why again in our worship center here, I don't know what, where you are, uh, images of palms. Why is that important? This in the day was the national symbol of the, what we'll call the nation of Israel. This was Israel. This stood for pride in our country. It was our identity. This represents victory. We're proud. We're triumphant. If you uh, read in the old covenant, uh, where, how they built the temple, they would etch into the stonework uh, palm fronds. If you look at money minted at the time, you'll find palm fronds. Th this was who we are. I I've, I've said it this way. If, if you ever watch the, uh, say the Olympics and an American wins, you know how they take the flag and they drape the American flag over their back and they you know, kind of take a lap. Okay. This would be the symbol of Israel and it was who we are. It was, it was, this is us. All right. And uh, you got to understand they see Jesus coming in. Here he comes. And I got to explain one other thing to you real fast. Okay. I, I, I want you to imagine you're looking at something this way. You're looking at the city of Jerusalem. I want you to picture, and I should have, I should have just pulled the picture. I just didn't think to do it. I'm sorry. Picture the dome of the rock. Okay. You remember that gold dome that you see? Whenever you see that picture, you're looking from the Mount of Olives. You're looking across what's called the Kidron Valley. You're over here. You're looking across and that, that dome of the rock is a Muslim uh, uh, like epicenter of their faith now, but that's where the temple stood in the time of Jesus. That's why that land is so valuable and so contested. That is where the temple was. And, and so you got a picture, you're over here on this side of the mountain and Bethany, Bethpage is right over here, about two miles max. It's right over here. So Jesus is going to get on this donkey and he's riding down this hill, coming down the hill, down the Mount of Olives, cross the Kidron Brook and then up the other side and he's going to go into Jerusalem. So get that image in your mind because everything about his entrance is the king has come. The king has come. Power. We finally, finally, this is it. This is the moment. Folks, power is what they wanted. Power is what they felt they needed. Power to do what? It's so easy to understand. Power to defeat Rome. That's what we want in our King, in our Messiah. We want you to get rid of this menacing force called Rome. And they believe Jesus is the one. And that's why they're whipped up in a nationalistic frenzy, flipping palm fronds everywhere. 
because finally the day has come. Now I wanna show you an interesting contrast. I wanna show you an interesting contrast. This comes from the Gospel of Luke. Listen carefully because I just told you what the people did. I want you to hear what Jesus was thinking as he did this, okay? This is Luke 19. As he, Jesus, approached Jerusalem and saw the city, that thing I just, he's just coming down the hill, he's looking at the city, he wept. He wept over it. He just began to cry. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You got the wrong agenda. You have totally missed the point and he can see it as they're doing all this craziness around them. You're missing the point. And so he cries because he realized what's gonna happen. What he's saying is, and, he, and it came to pass, Titus in 70 AD, not that long after Jesus died, just came in and destroyed Jerusalem again. And it was horrific for the Jewish people. And Jesus is basically going, you guys, this is not why I've come. This is not my agenda. Now here's what you do need to understand. Jesus did not come to overwhelm overcome or overthrow Rome. He did come to overwhelm, overthrow and overcome a different enemy. The enemy that you have to this very day and that I have to this very day. He came to conquer triumphantly, overpower sin, your sin, my sin. And the consequence of that sin is death. And you're gonna die for eternity if he didn't do something about it. And Jesus came as a king to conquer your greatest enemy that you don't even know you have. And we're getting so far away from this in our cultural uh, conscience. We just think we're gonna do all these things that we just do now. We lie, we cheat, we steal, we, we're immoral. We're all of it without consequence. And Jesus knows, oh no, not without consequence. The greatest enemy ever. See, Jesus rode in on a donkey because he didn't come to conquer what they wanted. He came to conquer what humility would conquer. And that is that he would sacrifice himself and go to a cross and be killed for the payment that you owe God and that I owe God in violation of my guilt and your guilt. Now, I'm done part one, but I'm not done. I'm so close to done. There's two parts of this. I can't leave without talking about what was up with Judas. You ever thought about this? What was up with Judas? If you don't know what Judas did, Judas was one of the handpicked followers of Jesus. He was, a, he was an apostle. He, he was one of the 12. And uh, it says that he, uh, he went to the chief priests and the religious leaders and he said, um, how much will you pay me if I uh, turn him in? What do you mean? How much will you pay me if I lead you to where he is? Well, you can capture him, you can catch him. Wait a minute, okay, so you're saying if we give you something, you'll take us to Jesus? Absolutely, uh, and I'll do it privately. I'll do it in discreetly, really. Oh, that'd be worth about, I don't know, 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver it is. They make a deal, they give him 30 pieces of silver. Judas is up in, the, uh, up in the upper room, which is, again, back on our little map here. Here's the dome, the upper room's over here. Judas is with Jesus, and that's when Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. Remember this whole thing? Is it I, is it I? And then he goes out, Judas goes out. He goes out and he goes, gets to the scribes and the Pharisees because he knows where Jesus is gonna go. And it's exactly where he went. You can read it in John. He comes out, he goes down the Kidron Valley, he comes up the other side, he's going to the, Mount of Olives to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane, which I'm gonna talk about next week. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas knows that's where he's gonna go. That's where Jesus hung, not in Jerusalem. He hung in places like that. And so he, uh, 
he gets the mob. And this is another thing you don't want to miss this. This is so vivid if you understand. Here's, here's Jerusalem, the, the valley. Here's the Garden of Gethsemane. It says they, he led an entourage with clubs and torches. What does that mean? Jesus could see these guys coming. That's what you got to understand. They're coming down the hill. And I'm telling you, you can see it clear, plain as day. I've, I've stood there. You can, and it's at night and they're coming. And Jesus, all he's got to do on this side, the Mount of Olives, you top, top, and it's all the way down to the Jordan River and Jericho. It's the wilderness that was John 4, or Matthew 4. All he's got to do is just, I, I'm out. These guys are going to kill me. He pop, he could just pop, just get out. Just. Nope. He holds his ground. Judas comes up and uh, he comes up to Jesus and he kisses him. And Jesus goes, with a kiss, Judas, with a kiss? And uh, that was the signal that he had arranged, the one I kiss. That's who it is. So um, they nab Jesus and they take him away. And then they do all kinds of things. And, but there's a little part of Judas we don't quite understand. Let me read it to you, okay? Uh, this is Matthew 27. When, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. And that's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and he hanged himself. What? What do you mean he went away and hanged himself? Why would he do that? You're loaded. You got paid. This is what people think. Scholars think all he was trying to do. If Jesus, this is Thursday. If Jesus won't pick a fight with Rome, he's going to pick a fight with Jesus. He's going to force Jesus. He's going to get them. So they pick the fight with him. If Jesus won't pick the fight, he'll make it happen. And Jesus, he, they're expecting Jesus is going to bust out. And man, it's war. It's finally happening. And Jesus goes, I'm here. And he goes with them. And Peter wants to fight with the sword. Remember that? And he goes, put it away. And Judas is going, oh, man. That's probably not what he said, but that's what he was thinking. He said, I got this all wrong. And then he realized what he had done. And just, oh. one last one I got to visit with real fast. That's Pilate. You just can't skip Pilate. What's up with Pilate? Uh, Pilate was a Roman magistrate that Jesus had to appear before. And the Jews took him and uh, literally turned him over to Pilate because they can't crucify. They don't have the power. It's, they're under Rome. Rome has to crucify. They got to get him convicted. So they haul him off and it goes back and forth between some other civil leaders as well as religious leaders. But anyway, it gets it to Pilate. And let me just close this message by talking about what happened there. Okay. This is John 18. Uh, Pilate then went back inside the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Now you understand this implication? The king of the Jews, David, David's throne. You're going to lead these people. Are you? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others tell you about me? And I, a Jew, Pilate responded, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Catch this, very important. This is what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. No, I'm not about any of this. I am a king and I am building a kingdom. You are a king then, said Pilate. And Jesus answers, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world, this world, is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and he said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas, Barabbas. And they begin to shout. Pilate 
took Jesus and had him flogged. Now, oh, by the way, it tells us now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Other translations will tell you he was a he was an insurrectionist. He, he was a terrorist. He was a known bad guy. He was a prisoner because he was a menace to society. And they're shouting, give us him. Okay, stay with it. Uh, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him with a purple robe and they went up against him again and said, hail king of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis of a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, all mocking royalty, all mocking David. Pilate said to them, here's the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. Cru what, what do you want me to do? With crucify him. That's the same people that were shouting Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of what happened? Less than a week. Folks, you know what happened? They discovered that Jesus wasn't about fulfilling their agenda. And therefore he is of no use to us. That's why they turned on him. They wanted a Messiah who was gonna fight Rome and this guy's not gonna do it. Give us Barabbas. Don't miss this. Barabbas is who they wanted Jesus to be. He's far more what we're looking for than that guy. That guy would never be caught on a donkey. Give us Barabbas. We will do more to overcome Rome with Barabbas than we would ever with Jesus. You see, they wanted an earthly kingdom and Jesus didn't offer them that. And he doesn't offer you and me that, frankly, despite all that's going on in America. He doesn't offer us an earthly kingdom. Earthly kingdoms are kingdoms of men. They're about nations and powers and economies and politics, agendas, social agendas, all that. That's not what Jesus came. Jesus came to be a king of a kingdom that is not of this world. And the sooner this dawns on us, the better it's gonna be for us. His kingdom is about truth and righteousness and souls and eternity and forgiveness and grace, mercy, whole different set of values. So what, what was the problem on Palm Sunday? And here's the big idea and I'll close with it. The problem is Jesus doesn't fulfill promises he never made nor does he meet expectations he never promised. I want to tell you something about humanity. We all have a tendency to expect things from God that God never said he'd do for us. We all have a tendency to get really angry at God when he doesn't do what we wanted him to do as if we were God. We see, you see, how many people do you know no longer walk with Jesus and they don't walk with Jesus anymore? Why? Because he didn't do for them what they thought he should do. He didn't keep their spouse alive. He didn't keep their kid alive. He didn't. And Philip Lincoln didn't keep my marriage. He didn't give me the job. He didn't. And all of a sudden it's like, I'm done. I'm done with him. He was a letdown. He didn't answer, he didn't answer the prayer I asked. I, I don't got no use for him anymore. Crucify him. Jesus didn't come here to fulfill expectations that you and I place on him. Promises he never promised to keep. And don't lose sight of who Jesus is because Jesus isn't who you thought he should be. Jesus is who Jesus is and he's building a kingdom. And you know what he came to do? To invite you into his kingdom not to take your invitation into your kingdom. You understand what I just said? He invites you into his kingdom. He's the king though. May his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's his agenda, not your agenda, not my agenda. Jesus is incredible. 
but don't put expectations on him that he never agreed to. You will find yourself frustrated. Let me close this part one, part, part two next week. You're going to come. We'll bring somebody. We'll show you a different story next week. Let's pray. God, thanks for our time. Thanks for your word. God, thanks for what this is all about. Lord, we love you. And we sometimes get this so wrong. We miss the point and we create ideas and agendas that are just not yours, but we put them on you. And then we get frustrated when it doesn't happen that way. I feel like you let us down when you never said we need to be in about that. Help us to learn from this, God. Help us to understand your kingdom is not of this world. And it doesn't operate the way the world's kingdoms operate. Help us to get it. I pray for us. Father, forgive us for the things that we have done that imply we know more than you know and we are literally using you to get what we want instead of losing ourselves to give you what you want. Help us, Father, to learn, sort it out. And I pray for us in this, in Jesus' name. And if you agreed with any of that, would you please say amen. amen. Bless you guys.